Welcome to worship with the Southern Albemarle Charge. That is Scottsville United Methodist and Mount Zion United Methodist. And I am honored to serve as the pastor here. I am Pastor Laura. Welcome to worship. Thank you for joining us on this day that the Lord has made. And so we can rejoice and be glad in it. Be glad that we are in the presence of our Lord. Let us pray. O oh Lord, we are united by your grace. Help us to help each other and bear one another's cross. Let us give all friendly aid and feel each other's cares. Let us grow closer to one another and move closer to you. With confidence, we seek you, and we know our prayer is heard. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing our opening hymn, Bind Us Together. reading this morning is a little different. It's actually three scripture readings. Today we're going to hear from Ecclesiastes chapter 4, Proverbs 18, and John chapter 15. So let's begin with Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verses 9 through 12. Two are better than one, because they have a good reward for their toil. If they fall, one will lift up the other. But woe to one who is alone and falls and does not have in another to help. Again, if two lie together, they keep warm, but how can one keep warm alone? And though one might prevail against another, two will withstand one. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. From Proverbs chapter 18, verse 24. Some friends play at friendship, but a true friend sticks closer than one's nearest kin. And from John chapter 15, verses 12 through 17. Jesus says, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends, if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer because the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my father. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I have appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that the father will give you whatever you ask him in my name. I am giving you these commands so that you may love one another. These are the word of God for all people. Thanks be to God. This past week, I checked my Facebook account to see how many friends I have, and my account says that I have 570. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with this website, Facebook is kind of like an old line address book where you can Keep in touch with your friends and share pictures and random thoughts that you have with one another. Now, I was an early adopter of Facebook. The site started when I was in college, and in the beginning, you had to be in college to join, and it was only released to certain colleges at certain times. So by the end of my freshman year, I joined the site. Most of my friends at that time were my fellow college students or maybe some of my high school friends who also went to colleges where they could join Facebook. But then more and more of my high school friends became eligible to join. And as the website grew in popularity, more and more people were able to join. And eventually, it pretty much became anyone with an internet connection could join. So besides friends and family and colleagues, I became friends with people that I maybe only met once or twice at a meeting or on a trip. You know, Facebook seemed like a good way to network and to stay connected. And now Facebook tells me that I have 570 friends. 
570. That sounds like a lot, but I know that number is actually fairly low. In terms of Facebook friends, it is not unusual for people to have a thousand or more friends on Facebook. But at least in my case, the vast majority of those friends are more like acquaintances. I mean, some of them I haven't communicated with in years, if not decades. Others are fun to hang out with, but we don't really share any deep conversations. Now I mostly just use Facebook to see pictures and updates of my family, to network and share ministry ideas with colleagues, and to enjoy silly memes and videos. On the flip side, I have learned about something called Anam Cara. The Irish poet and philosopher John O'Donohue wrote a book about this idea, and to be honest, I have not read that book. It's still on my to-be-read pile, but I find the premise interesting. From excerpts I've read, O'Donohue says that, quote, Anam is the Gaelic word for soul, and Kara is the word for friend. So Anam Kara in the Celtic world was the soul friend. In the early Celtic church, a person who acted as a teacher, companion, or spiritual guide was called an Anam Kara. It originally referred to someone to whom you confessed, revealing the hidden intimacies of your life. With the Anam Kara, you could share your innermost self, your mind, and your heart. This friendship was an act of recognition and belonging. When you had an Anam Kara, your friendship cut across all convention, morality, and category. You were joined in an ancient and eternal way with the friend of your soul." End quote. I think this is a beautiful concept. Yet I know that the vast majority of my Facebook friends would not fall into this category. I want us to keep this idea of Anam Kara in our minds as we listen to our main scripture text for today. We are following the stories of Samuel, Saul, and David this summer. We have spent several weeks now in the book of 1 Samuel, and last week we made it up to 1 Samuel chapter 17. Today we're skipping ahead a few chapters, but some important things do happen in those chapters that we're skipping over, so I encourage you to read those on your own. But for our purposes right now, let me sum up. When we last heard from 1 Samuel, we heard the story of David and Goliath. And as we know, David beats Goliath, and the Israelites are able to soundly defeat the Philistine army. David is the hero. At this time, David becomes friends with Jonathan, the son of King Saul. They even make a covenant, a solemn, holy agreement with each other to look after one another and to care for each other. However, King Saul's not too happy with David anymore. After David beats Goliath, he becomes a successful military leader, and he defeats the Philistines several more times. And with his military successes, David becomes more popular than Saul with the Israelite people. So out of jealousy, Saul tries multiple times to have David killed, either in battle or in assassination attempts. But every time, David eludes capture and death. He continues to fight on behalf of Israel, and he is victorious. Eventually, one of Saul's daughters, Michal, falls in love with David, and then they end up married. So David is now Saul's son-in-law, and David's best friend is his brother-in-law. But Saul continues to dislike David, and one time Michal, his wife, even has to save David from one of Saul's assassination attempts. Jonathan, too, is in a tough spot. He loves his dad, Saul, and since Saul is king, Jonathan is high up in Saul's administration. But Jonathan also loves David. They are best friends. They are soul friends. They have pledged to support and help and look after one another. So Jonathan is torn between David and Saul, and that is where today's reading picks up. We are in 1 Samuel chapter 20, verses 1 through 17. Listen for the word of God. David fled from Naioth in Ramah. He came before Jonathan and said, What have I done? What is my guilt? And what is my sin against your father that he is trying to take my life? Jonathan said to him, Perish the thought, you shall not die. My father does nothing, either great or small, without disclosing it to me. And why should my father hide this from me? Never. But David also swore, your father knows well that you like me, and he thinks, do not let Jonathan know this, or he will be grieved. 
But truly, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, there is but a step between me and death. Then Jonathan said to David, Whatever you say, I will do for you. David said to Jonathan, Tomorrow is the new moon, and I should not fail to sit with the king at the meal, but let me go so that I may hide in the field until the third evening. If your father misses me at all, then say, David earnestly asked leave of me to run to Bethlehem, his city, for there is a yearly sacrifice there for all the family. If Saul says, good, it will be well with your servant. But if he is angry, then know that evil has been determined by him. Therefore, deal kindly with your servant, for you have brought your servant into a sacred covenant with you. But if there is guilt in me, kill me yourself. Why should you bring me to your father? Jonathan said, Far be it from you, if I knew that it was decided by my father that evil should come upon you, would I not tell you? Then David said to Jonathan, Who will tell me if your father answers you harshly? Jonathan said to David, Come, let us go out into the field. So they both went out into the field. Jonathan said to David, By the Lord, the God of Israel, when I have sounded out my father about this time tomorrow or on the third day, if he is not well disposed towards David, shall I not then send and disclose it to you? But if my father intends to do you harm, the Lord do so to Jonathan, and more also if I do not disclose it to you and send you away so that you may go in safety. May the Lord be with you as he has been with my father. If I am still alive, show me the faithful love of the Lord. But if I die, never cut off your faithful love from my house, even if the Lord were to cut off every one of the enemies of David from the face of the earth. Thus Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying, May the Lord seek out the enemies of David. Jonathan made David swear again by his love for him, for he loved him as he loved his own life. This is the word of God for all people. Thanks be to God. If we keep on reading in chapter 20, and I hope you do, we would hear that Jonathan does indeed find out that Saul wants to kill David. Jonathan keeps his promise to David and warns him about Saul's intentions so that David can flee to safety. Reading this passage from 1 Samuel, I'm reminded of those First scripture readings that we heard earlier about friendship. Two are better than one. They can lift each other up. A true friend sticks closer than one's nearest kin. There is no greater love than this than to lay down one's life for one's friend. The friendship of David and Jonathan exhibits these qualities. They lift each other up. They watch out for one another and care for one another. Jonathan definitely exemplifies this by saving David's life, but later on in 1st and 2nd Samuel, we learn that Saul and Jonathan die and all of Saul's household dies. The way then becomes clear for David to become king, but David doesn't forget what happens in today's reading. He remembers this promise that he made to Jonathan to never cut off his faithful love from Jonathan's house. And so after David is king, he seeks out any remaining members of Jonathan's family, and he finds one remaining son of Jonathan. And instead of killing this son, and thus removing any claimants to the throne, David welcomes Jonathan's son into his house and treats him well. He lifts up and honors his friend Jonathan by his care of Jonathan's family. Jonathan stuck closer to David than to his family. Jonathan betrayed his father in order to save David's life because Jonathan knew that his father was wrong. So he chose to honor his friendship. David stuck close to Jonathan by his care for Jonathan's son. I'd imagine that there were some people in David's family that were not too happy to welcome the grandson of the former king into their household. But David chose to honor his friendship with Jonathan. And while neither David nor Jonathan physically died for the other, they did risk a lot. I mean, Jonathan risked his life disobeying the king, his father. David risked his kingdom. I mean, after all, Jonathan's son was a direct descendant of the former king and could have tried to overthrow David. David and Jonathan give us an example of what true friendship 
soul friendship looks like. They shared their innermost selves with one another, and their friendship cut across all boundaries, even the boundary of death. Perhaps some of us have been blessed with this kind of deep soul friendship in our lives, but I'm willing to guess that not all of us have experienced this or currently have this kind of friendship in our lives. Loneliness is a big deal in our society. I've preached on this before. The Surgeon General of the United States has declared that we face a loneliness epidemic. And I firmly believe that we as the church have this gift of community that we can offer to the larger world that God wants us to use as a way to push back against this loneliness epidemic. So with this in mind, what can we learn from the story of Jonathan and David and their friendship? In this story of their friendship, we see David and Jonathan raising each other up. They consider the needs of the other. They make thoughtful sacrifices, appropriate sacrifices for the good of the other. They stand up for each other. They honor the other, even after life's difficulties and then death separate them from one another. Friendship for them means having someone you can bear your soul to, having someone who truly knows you and loves you anyway, having someone who will look after you, having someone who will hold you accountable to living according to God's will. How do we mirror these practices then in our friendships and our relationships with others? And if we don't, mirror these practices, then what step can we take to start? John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, has a good model for us. He divided his fellow Methodists into small groups called bands. They would meet together regularly to hold one another accountable to being a faithful disciple of God. They would ask each other how their souls were doing. They shared where they saw God at work in the world. They confessed their sins and temptations. They held one another accountable to following God and to practicing spiritual disciplines. They looked out for each other and honored the struggles and the life experiences of one another. Can we incorporate these ideas into our friendships, into the relationships that we have, into the community that we extend? As we continue this week to contemplate this story of David and Jonathan and their friendship, my prayer for us is that we will be open to where God is working to bring us into relationship and friendship with one another, and that we will all come to experience an Anankara, a soul friend. Thanks be to God. Amen. Join me in affirming our faith using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I hope that you are mindful, paying attention to the announcements that we have in our weekly email newsletter. If you are not getting that, go to the Google form in the description of our video and sign up for it there. That's also a place where you can go. Um, if you have questions, if you just want to contact me, share joys and concerns, that's a really good place to go. Well, we've got some interesting stuff coming up over the next month or so, so I hope you can join us. We've got Kids Club happening tomorrow. We have next Sunday evening a uh, planned giving, um, charitable giving, presentation. It should be really educational and interesting. So if you are in the Scottsville area, I hope you can join us from 5 to 7 for potluck dinner and this planned giving presentation. So like I said, just stay up to date with all that we have going on. And be in prayer for us, please.
because we need your prayer so that all that we do is infused with the Holy Spirit, is infused with God working in us and through us so that we can make disciples. I also hope that you are praying for the needs of our community. We can see those specific prayer concerns again listed in that weekly email newsletter. And if there's anything we can pray for you about, please let us know. But I invite us to now join our hearts as one as we turn to the Lord in prayer. Lord, thank you for the friendships, the relationships, the community that we have. Thank you for how you have formed us. Thank you for how our hearts have spoken to one another. Thank you that we have a place where we can turn in times of difficulty and know that someone cares. And now, Lord, give us the courage to open up our community, to extend our community to others, to not only invite them in, but to seek them out. Lord, we come before you with gratitude for the joys of this past week, with anticipation of the joys of the week to come. And Lord, we come before you, holding before you the needs of our loved ones, the needs of ourselves. We pray for healing for the sick and the injured. We pray for the safety for those who, who are at risk of harm. We remember especially the first responders and the firefighters who are fighting wildfires but we pray for all who do not feel safe, that they will find a safe haven, that there will be justice done. For those who are anxious, breathe your peace into their hearts. For those who are unsure, guide their steps. For those who mourn, comfort them. Lord, we pray for our elected leaders that you will guide them to work for the good of all. Lord, we pray especially that you will guide our leaders, our, the world leaders, to work for peace, for a just end to the wars in Israel and Gaza, and Ukraine and Sudan. And that we, your church, can respond where there is need, where there is hunger that we will feed people, where there is destruction and devastation that we will come bearing hope and help to rebuild as needed. And Lord, that we may always and everywhere be a witness to you and to your love and mercy. So, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And in this time of silence, hear our unspoken prayers. And help us to hear from you. We pray in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us, not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I also want to thank you for your generosity 
in giving of your gifts, your monetary resources to support the work of Mount Zion and the work of Scottsville, this kingdom work that God has called us to do. Let us pray. Lord, bless the gifts that we are about to receive, those we have received. May your spirit fill them and fill us so that we will use them to continue to extend this community to others to seek them out so that all can come to know your love. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I did forget to let you know that if you want to send in your offering, you can send that to the church office at P.O. Box 280, Scottsville, Virginia, 24590. That address should be in the description of the video. Now let us lift our voices in praise by singing our doxology. Our closing hymn is Blessed Be the Tie That Binds. Let's sing. into this week, ready to extend our community, to take the next step in our relationships so that we can begin to exhibit, to echo those traits of David and Jonathan, so that we can echo your love. In the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.